Welcome to the start of Grind. How many have heard of Qualtrics, first of all? How many of you heard about us going to school from university? All right. Um, so today I'm going to talk about bootstrapping. I don't claim to believe that there's a right or wrong way to run your business or to create a business or to grow your business. I've done everything the wrong way and it's worked beautifully. Um, I also started a business in Provo, Utah. We're now 300 employees. On my street, there are four buildings. Ancestry.com, just sold for one point something billion dollars. Vivint, we just sold to Blackstone for two billion dollars. And then there's Qualtrics. We all have run a different playbook. Entirely different. So, I'm gonna tell you about mine. I'm gonna tell you about bootstrapping. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I bootstrapped a company for 10 years. Um, until this year. We'll talk a little bit about that. Am I a hypocrite? Or do I just innovate? I don't know. We'll talk about that. Um, but I don't think there's a right or wrong way. I think it's whatever works for you. And I think you've got to be open or you're going to miss the boat. So as I mentioned, we stayed pretty much with a couple rules as we ran our business. We're not going to take outside capital. We're going to grow it ourselves. And we sat in a basement from 2002 until 2006, almost five years, to the point where we were making $100,000 in revenue running out of a basement. And that is very, very, very difficult to do. I think I quit five different times. But I quit five times last year, so it's all, it's all part of it. No, I didn't. Just kidding. Uh, but there are some really, really good lessons that happened to our company by staying in a basement for that long. And I think that they're life lessons, and I wouldn't trade it for $500 million, and actually, I didn't when we were offered that much to sell our company. First, hiring was really difficult. This is the first hire. I had a lot of college roommates. I was in college at the time. I had a lot of friends who did not believe or think this was sexy and would not look up from whatever they were studying to take a bet on something that looked like this. <laughs> Stuart Orgel did. He's a Texas boy. His father's an entrepreneur. He turned down a $60,000 job to come out to the Bay Area to work for $8,000 his first year and no equity. How many of you would do that? Yeah. All right, we got one. All right, you're hired, right? <laughs> He, he made 12000 his second year. That's a pretty good raise, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's huge. We'd all go for that. So I actually, I'm fortunate to have the first email that I ever sent Stuart um, on December 15, 2003. said, welcome to Qualtrics, Stuart. We are excited. And mind you, there's just two of us there. We are excited to, to start a new year. Feel free to pick up your parking pass along with your key from the secretary. Enjoy your stay, and your title is all in any of the following. CEO, CFO, CTO, Director, National Director, VP of Ops, VP of Sales, Director of Research and Development. Seems to be a hot title these days. Uh, there's a ton of opportunity as far as leadership and growth are concerned. From the beginning, we have opted to run this business on a shoestring budget. In doing so, there are many pros and cons. Let's take this to the next level. We need hungry people. With motivation, we are selling corporate research tools to PhD level executives in every co company we can find. By the beginning of the year, I would like to have a sales force of five people. We need to sit, sit together and make a plan. So we've been making that plan for 10 years and filling that plan out. And we, we still operate pretty much the same way, although it's gotten a, a lot bigger. But Stu actually saw something and took a, took a bet on it. But more than anything, he bet on himself. And I think that's the number one thing. Everyone thinks they're a bad A and they want to come out and rule the world, but there's a lot of people that won't bet on themselves. And if you're talented and you're willing to bet on yourselves, it's amazing what you can do. And I think that's one of the benefits of being a bootstrap company is you'll actually find gears you never knew you had. And often, as humans, it takes us to put 
we have to be put in a situation where we have to grind to find years that we never knew we had. And it would be a tragedy if you actually surpassed those moments to, to gain that. One of the principles, eat what you kill. We had to eat what we killed. Here we are at our first trade show. And it actually was a trade show because we had to trade our product to go to the show because we had no money. You can see that there are three ring binders sitting there to demo pictures of our product because we didn't have enough money to pay for the internet connection. I would not trade that for the world. We had to be innovative. And this is how we did it. I remember the next show, not having enough money for swag, everyone was handing something out, so we went next door and bought a bunch of vitamin water. And we handed out vitamin water, and it was right when it came out, and I'd like look at it and see what kind, and then try to profile people. Hey, you need energy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that would have never happened. That would have never happened if I was sitting there with trinkets and toys from China ready to hand out to everyone. We had a lot more people at our booth than Adobe had next door handing out $5 and $10 gifts. So I think there's something about eating what you kill. Another principle, you got to nail it before you scale it. Look at this picture. This is the first day we launched Qualtrics' a system. We rebuilt our system four times. What good does it do to throw $20 million at these guys right here? Not a whole lot. we got to figure out what we're doing. We're able to scale a business very quickly. We really started scaling our business in about 2007, 2008, 2009 is when we really took off. If you can nail it in a day, someone else can nail it in half a day. Right? There's a lot of smart cats out there. So there's some important principles about nailing it. And one of them, I think, that's probably most important with the Qualtrics journey is staying focused. We decided that we were going to focus on the academic market to start. Primarily because I didn't have any money. I could find their profiles online. I actually started this with my father, who's an academic researcher. He's a scientist. We heard Clayton Christensen. I felt like I was talking to my dad when I was talking to him. It's, it's very similar. And I said, I've got a built-in case study of here, here of someone who wants to buy our research software. There's got to be more of them. So I made a goal that I was going to go find out, find out who these people were and sign them up. And I would call my brother, who was a director of product at Google at the time, and I would say, this is what we're doing. Or a competitor just raised $30 million, and I'm sitting in a basement. How are we going to compete? He'd say, Ryan, where are you at on your academic goal? Well, what is your academic goal? Well, I want to get 250 universities. All right? That's all we're going to talk about. So whenever you call me, which is daily now, don't talk to me about anything but the 250. So I call them up and say, hey, guess what? We're going this way. Hey, this person's called. Where are you on your 250? Well, the 250. And for two years, all I thought about was 250 schools. I play golf, not really right now, but in the past I play golf. And the golf swing's very complex. And you can get pretty analytical with it. But it's amazing how many problems are solved if you just keep your frickin' head still. And it's very similar to business. There is a lot of noise, and it's easy to nail your company if you're focused on one objective, and you're, gonna, you're hell-bent on getting there. And that's what we were, we were doing. We were only focused on 250. And we thought, once we hit 250, the rest will take care of itself. And that's exactly what happened. And I'll talk about how that evolved. But I don't think you can speed up sometimes the process there. I think it's absolutely critical that you nail it before you scale it. And there's an argument that you're going to be incrementally way further on because it's actually easy to scale when you have it nailed. And we're seeing that right now, and I'll show you. Here's an interesting principle. Um, there's no plan B. I talked about we only bring what we need or we, we, we have gears that we haven't found. I love the movie Jerry Maguire because he only had one client. It was amazing what he was able to do with that client. 
And that's the same thing that happened with us. And until you're in a situation where you've got to leverage a client or relationship for everything you can get out of it, then you don't know what's there. First person ever to buy Qualtrics, Angela Lee at the Kellogg School of Business. I actually sat in a meeting with her three months ago. She stood up in front of 60 people and told, her, told, told them how she was the first Qualtrics user. She was the first one that bought into the vision way in you know, 2002, 2003. It's pretty cool. She got her MBA students on. She told another fellow faculty member at Wharton. That person got up at one of their big conferences and said she conducted research and gathered insights on Qualtrics. And what happened? The rest is history. The virality of our product took off. And today we have over 95 of the top 100 business schools and 1,300 universities on our platform. 2007, well, hold on. 2007, we said we're making $100,000 a month. We're profitable. We think we can make payroll. We've got 20 people in the basement. The garbage collector can't come because cars are in the way. The neighbors are complaining. Probably time to get an office. Are you sure? I mean, no, seriously. We were a little slow on this front. Um, moved out of the basement. What happened in 2008, 2009? It's kind of a scary time, right? I remember my dad, still teaching at the university, would send me emails going, the sky's going to fall. I wore a pin that said, I'm not going to participate in the recession. I don't want anything to do with it. Say no to the recession. <laughs> and that was really the mindset, right? This was it. This is what we'd worked so hard to build. We weren't stopping now. What happened was absolutely phenomenal. Students started graduating. And corporations who I had tried to talk to earlier, and I call up, I flew in on one of these airlines today, I remember calling the airline and saying, hey, you got to use Qualtrics to collect customer feedback and gain insights. Ah, our customers will just call us if they got complaints, all right? <laughs> well, when this corporation started struggling in 2008, 2009, they pick up the phone call back and say, well, maybe you're right. Maybe we don't know everything. And a lot of companies were in this mode where they'd just throw mud at the wall and see what would stick until they started missing. And it's crazy if you're testing million dollar decisions or you're implementing million dollar decisions, what a little test or concept or doing a little bit of research, um, which our friend talked about earlier, can do. So they started actually asking questions. And I'm going to go back to the Jerry Maguire principle. There was an individual at Phillips Electronics. He ran research. He reported to a head in Amsterdam, gets a call one day and says, your job's actually been moved to Amsterdam. You can move from Atlanta or you can find another job. He calls me up, says, I'm leaving. Do you know where another job is in Atlanta? One of our first Qualtrics corporate users. I was like, man, we're just making inroads here. I said, no, but let me tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a Qualtrics license. Go find a consulting project and you can keep your family afloat for a while. He calls back two weeks later, says, I found a project. I'm running it on Qualtrics. I made $30,000 with Cox Communication. And money mattered to us then. And I said, you know what? Just remember me. This one's on us. Take care of your family. So what happened? Three weeks later, Joe lands at Russell Athletic. Russell Athletic calls me on the first day, hey, Ryan, we want to redo all research on Qualtrics. A year later, Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett buys Russell, rolls him up into Fruit of the Loom. What happens? I get a call from Fruit of the Loom. Hey, we want to do this. And the word spread. We kept leveraging customers to the point where now we have over 5,000 customers on the corporate side. We signed up over 600 enterprises last quarter. So what does all this mean? With all these people surveying and collecting data and insights, in 2012, we sent well over a billion surveys that were sent out from our customers. So, so needless to say, um, I think one of the important things when I talk about scalability is that we've been able to scale very quickly once we nailed it. We've gone from 150 to three, 300 employees in one year, okay? Triple digit growth in every aspect of our business, including revenue.
So once you nail that model, it's pretty easy to scale. And I think outside funding can help a lot, but I also think people take funding way too early because they're afraid to go into that, I would kind of call it desperation mode, but I love desperation mode. That's when the good stuff happens. That's when the vitamin water comes out. That's when the trade show creativity comes out. That's when you're leveraging Angela Lee. That's when you're leveraging Joe. And when you're sitting in your, in your, in your startup or you're thinking about your idea, ask yourself what mode you're in or what gear you're in. And I promise there's a lot more gears that you haven't figured out yet. And that's super important. Uh, it's been a 10 year overnight success, right? Uh, it's, uh, this is an interesting thing because I broke my rule this year and VCs have been reaching out to us for over three years and we were not really focused. I used to tell them I don't want any investment, we're not ready, not interested. And Excel Partners had reached out for three years to us and we signed a deal uh, in May. It was the largest deal between Sequoia and Excel, $70 million. Actually, I was at the Fortune Brainstorm conference, and uh, Mark Andreessen stood up and said he just raised $100 million with GitHub. I had actually gone out because my partner said they didn't want to raise any capital. That was my dad's number one rule. Go do whatever you want. Blow up this business, but don't raise any capital. And we, um, we, had, we had raised $100 million, and we actually scaled it back to get these partners. And a lot of people um, have, have been have reached out, been very congratulating to this and the $70 million investment, but I want to make a strong point that that's not the way you treat venture capital. Um, this is not the destination. I could care less about the $70 million. Our fundraising was well um, overexposed. We could have raised 150, probably $200 million. So that's not the end. What's important is the two partners. We wanted to find partners where one and one would equal five. And I feel like that's what we've got, and we waited long enough. We didn't get married on the first date. So we were able to date these guys for a while and really understand what we were working with. And we're pretty excited. Um, I think opportunities come, but billion-dollar opportunities are pretty rare. I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm a smart entrepreneur. I think I'm a smart guy. But actually being able to predict in 2002 that data and insights would be at the future of where it is today is actually pretty hard. It's like everyone here trying to predict what the next Facebook was or we just heard about mobile. You know, no one can really tell you where it's going. But as Clayton Christian has said, there's some serious theories on how you govern your business. And if you govern by those theories, I think you can get to the right spot. There's not really a right or wrong answer. So don't congratulate me. Just wish me luck because that's what I've signed up for is uh, a billion dollar opportunity that we're going to take. I've been waiting my whole life for 2013 and the venture capitals just to get some smart people around us to, to make sure that we execute on it. So that's Qualtrics, everyone.